The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Liz with SWP. Um, I hope everyone's having a good afternoon in wherever you are, or a morning if you're in the U.S. Um, uh, Merck, did you take it away? Well, good day, everyone. This is Mark Anderson. I uh, want to say a couple of words of introduction to Bill Cunningham, our lead-off speaker this morning. We're fortunate to have Bill. Uh, he has uh, an incredibly busy and important job uh, leading the groundwater program of the U.S. Geological Survey. Groundwater is our one of the USGS's key uh, core competencies, I believe. I think we're also the agency home of groundwater within the United States. Uh, so leading that uh, program in terms of how we gather data, how the data is analyzed, and how that information is uh, infused into decision-making is, is a key part of Bill's job. We're pleased that he's able to take some time and introduce the program to us. So with, without any further uh, commentary on my part, uh, Bill, pleased to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, Mark, I'm assuming I'm coming through okay? Perfect. Okay, very good. Uh, so I know your work is about big data, uh, and I'll talk today about data at the USGS, but within the context of, of why we collect it, at least some of the reasons why we collect it, um, and that uh, including to help determine groundwater availability. Um, we want to uh, support decision making at the USGS, uh, and I know that's in your charge as well. Um, so hopefully uh, my remarks today will, will help you put uh, data into context within the groundwater system. I want to uh, acknowledge there on the front page a lot of the folks who have contributed to material uh, in this presentation. So next slide, Liz. <coughs> Thank you. So uh, today I've got uh, just about 22 slides here um, and we'll talk about groundwater availability in general, uh, how we get there at the USGS, uh, the way we approach it um, from the groundwater observations and data presentation tools standpoints, at least a couple of those tools that we use, but also uh, the groundwater tools and techniques involved in that. Uh, so I'll touch on how we obtain framework, aquifer framework information, the importance of simulation within, uh, within that uh, groundwater availability framework um, uh, and how data are used in the importance of data with respect to those simulations and how we put it all together for regional groundwater availability assessments. Next slide, Liz. And so you can, uh, you can follow along on the bottom of the page as well as to where we are in the presentation and the different pieces that I will touch on here. But I wanted to start with groundwater availability challenges. So in 2008, uh, the USGS uh, released uh, a publication that described how we would assess groundwater availability across the nation. Uh, there is a long history, as Mark said, of groundwater studies in the USGS, um, and we kind of had a renewed emphasis on it in, late, uh, in the late 2000s. Uh, and this document pointed out some of the many challenges that you are facing, that we all face, with ground, determining groundwater availability. We pointed out six of them in that document here. I wanted to touch on them today. Of course, groundwater is hidden from direct observation. We all know that. One thing that a lot of folks don't have a good handle on is number two, and that is that groundwater systems, uh, that the time required for the effective withdrawals in groundwater systems, the time for it to propagate through the system, uh, is different for every system. So uh, a pumping well may affect a stream in hours or, or days in one uh, hydrogeologic system, and it may take tens of years or even a hundred years before that effect is seen in another system. So that is unique to the system and something that needs to be understood to make decisions. 
Uh, the amount of uh, detail needed to describe the resource depends on your objectives uh, and what you plan to to the decisions you plan to make. Uh, change in groundwater levels is important depending on the type of groundwater system or even within a groundwater system. And I think those on the phone know that uh, the change, uh, the water level change in an unconfined aquifer is uh, significant, it has a, 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 a different, um, uh, different ramifications compared to uh, a confined system, uh, for instance. Um, we uh, we understand that not all the water pumped is consumed and some of the water is, is redistributed throughout the groundwater flow system and also that uh, chemistry of the water is very important in determining suitability. So in order to make decisions about groundwater, all of these pieces need to be understood. Groundwater is a fund or data is a fundamental piece of that, but there are other aspects as well. Next slide, Liz. So uh, the USGS is a federal agency. We work for the people of the United States. Um, you heard from Linda De Brewer last week, I believe, about our core data systems. Uh, we call it NWIS uh, at the USGS and NWIS Web. And I hope to put a little bit of that into context today. Uh, the, our work for the people of the United States has uh, always been translated into making our data and information available to the public. It's available at no cost because the American people have already paid for it. So, and it's been that way for more than 100 years at the USGS in the water uh, part of the USGS anyway. Um, though how we present it has certainly evolved over time. Uh, today, all of this information is available generally free over the internet. There's some specific reasons why certain parts of the data that we collect are not available. Uh, uh, at, at the instant they are collected, but eventually all of our data are shared. Um, the way we pay for that um, is kind of important to the type of information that you see in our systems. Uh, we, we have some data that are uh, funded by the, directly by the USGS, by the US Congress to the USGS, uh, and other data are funded by many customers of the USGS, states, counties, cities, towns, tribes, and other federal agencies in the US. So the source of the funding doesn't affect the availability of the data um, or the quality of the data. It does impact the frequency of data collection and uh, because the data collection frequency typically drives the cost of that. We do have uh, quality standards that we follow. I believe Linda talked about that last week and we take great pride in that at the USGS. We have standards for most aspects of water level and water quality data collection and in, in order to assure high, high quality data. That doesn't come without a cost and sometimes it creates in, internal conflicts for us. But um, And maybe the data quality objectives of a project only require a ballpark groundwater level measurement, for instance. Uh, the water level in a shallow well measured to within a foot to be a calibration target for a model, for instance. But uh, and that might need a project uh, data quality objective. But because USGS data are a public resource and we don't know how, we don't know the data quality objectives for all the users, we try to be as accurate and precise as we can for all measurements and the metadata associated with all measurements. So. That's kind of the background of the information, along with what Linda presented to you of all of the data in our data systems. Something I don't believe she touched on is something called Groundwater Watch. And so this is a system, uh, online system that we uh, created to uh, focus on the data in our NWIS system, the groundwater data in our NWIS system, and uh, to make it a little more uh, usable for decision makers. And here are some of the things that uh, are in that groundwater watch system. It's highlighted by a, a national map that puts the most recent water level in the context of the historic record in percentile classes of that water level measurement. And so an individual water, measure, water level measurement is compared to the, the uh, historic uh, range of measurements. Um, we characterize that by month in these monthly bar charts that's in the upper right-hand corner of your slide. 
Uh, so those percentiles are in the different colors of those bars. And the red line is our individual daily data points for uh, a given well. Uh, so we know uh, kind of what the status is compared to the history at that site. There are also other tools on this site, including a drought hydrograph um, that is in the uh, lower right hand corner there. Next slide. Thank you, Liz. So here's an example of uh, one of the ways that this sort of information is used by decision makers. So uh, there is a climate response network within the Groundwater Watch system. We're going to focus on the state of Pennsylvania in the northeastern part of the United States. So Pennsylvania uses the groundwater level information uh, in uh, the USGS system to help them determine on a state, on a county by county basis within the state of Pennsylvania, uh, whether to declare a drought emergency for uh, th that individual county. And so the map on the right shows the state of Pennsylvania uh, delineated by counties and different colors associated with those counties based on the status. So this is during this is taken during a drought situation. Um, and there are four quadrants to their decision making, the state's decision making about the drought declaration, one for groundwater, one for stream flow, one for precipitation, and one for the Palmer Drought Index. So using the groundwater levels in the Groundwater Watch system, along with stream flow information from the USGS, precip data, and their Palmer Drought uh, computations. Uh, they combine that information and make a decision about whether to declare a drought emergency in an individual county or not. Next slide. So that's more of what we at the national level would call, would call a, a local decision, uh, a statewide decision about water resources that is driven by data. Uh, we have an example here of a broader kind of longer term application within Groundwater Watch. And so this is a tool in Groundwater Watch that takes the data from an individual, from a principal aquifer on that on the upper right hand corner, that's a map of the principal aquifers of the US. And in a, a particular uh, um, principal aquifer called the California Coastal Basin Aquifer, in the, uh, which is highlighted in the lower right hand corner there within the red circle, we have uh, 110 wells in that aquifer uh, that are measured. And this composite hydrograph takes the water level information from all 110 wells and computes a composite hydrograph uh, for each year over the 30 year period of record depicted in this hydrograph and uh, illustrates it around the zero line there of the uh, percentage of water level range. And so this is just one tool in that toolbox uh, that provides a, a more of a, a kind of a historic uh, composite of water level change in that aquifer um, that would help kind of broader decision making about the status of the aquifer. So in, in any one individual place within the aquifer, uh, may, there may be uh, frequent changes in the water level, but more broadly speaking, what is the status of the resource? And this is so a broader tool that is available in Groundwater Watch. Next slide. Now the the, uh, we're proud of our groundwater level network in the USGS, but because of the way it's funded, uh, there are gaps in, in that network. And we've always known that there were gaps in the network because of that. To address that, the USGS uh, took some advice from a, a, an outside uh, review of it and said, uh, you need to be partnering with others uh, in order to uh, in order to be able to uh, report on this on a national basis. And so in 2007, we formed a group called the Subcommittee on Groundwater. 
which is an advisory group to the to the USGS. And that group uh, designed a national groundwater monitoring network using USGS data um, and also data from many other partners, primarily state agencies. So the idea behind this was that we would bring together federal groundwater level and groundwater quality data, as well as that same data collected by primarily state agencies, but also others, have a common framework for that reporting, reporting of that information, um, test it, which we did in five pilot states across the country, uh, got feedback from that, and then uh, initiated this national groundwater monitoring network. Next slide. So this combines USGS data with, with data from others as well. It's focused on these principal aquifers and major aquifers in the US. Um, but one of the key pieces of this, and this, this uh, slide shows the, you know, the framework document that guides selection of sites uh, and, and how they get included in this network. But one of the key pieces of this is that the data provider remains the authoritative data source. Uh, in other words, they, they collect the data, they hold that data. If they make changes to their data, they correct it, they improve it in any, any way, it is automatically, well, that's, they're, they're the authoritative source. There aren't multiple databases out there holding this information. Uh, and through web services, those data are shared in, in, in an overall portal. Um, the other key piece of this is that the data are of known quality, not necessarily uniform quality. So each data provider uh, shares their data quality standards as a part of uh, the partnership in this, in this uh, network. So it's not necessarily the same data standards as the USGS or anyone else in the network, but it is known what those data standards are. Next slide. And so we, uh, we have the USGS developed this uh, information portal that provide that kind of unifies all of that, that water level data. So right now, this slide depicts in the lower right hand corner what that map looks like for water level data or water quality data from all of the contributing agencies. So uh, we started this in 2015. Gradually, it is gradually growing as contributing agencies join the effort. There are now 29 of them, USGS just being one. Uh, and uh, as you can see from the slide, there are currently uh, uh, over 7,000 wells for water levels and close to 2,000 wells with water quality information in it. So if you'd like to explore that, the uh, URL for this site is at the bottom of the page. Next slide. So how is this sort of information used? Here's an example of how it's used, uh, how it was used during a, a drought situation in the upper Midwest of the United States, um, <clears throat> which in a flash drought situation came on, came on quickly, where the state of Montana and the state of North Dakota were hit by drought conditions. In the past, those would be two different systems data systems in two different states. Uh, and the data, you would have to go to those two states. They would have to share, be willing to share that information um, in order to compile it to see what the impact of this drought was. Uh, but under the National Groundwater Monitoring System, where they were already agreeing to share their information and it was available through this portal, uh, it could be presented in this way. Next slide. Uh, we, are, we are also working with uh, internationally with Canada to uh, to do this same thing, uh, and that is made uh, possible because of the standards that are used, not the standards to collect the information, but actually the standards to exchange the information. So those data standards are critical to data exchange. Next slide. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to shift into the framework tools now that we use with just one class of tools, 
hydrogeophysics. I know that in future talks, you'll be hearing about some of the uh, hydrogeophysics that is done in the USGS. Um, we, this is one of the primary tools that we use for aquifer characterization. It's important to know what the container is for the water, uh, the groundwater, and what that water level measurement that we just shared, what it reflects. And uh, it's important, we need to understand this and hydrogeophysics is one, uh, one way and an increasing way that we characterize that unseen, uh, that unseen aquifer, the unseen uh, container for the groundwater system. Um, we have an increased focus recently on groundwater and surface water exchange uh, with stream bed conductance and temperature methods uh, as well. Uh, and, and we often use drones and or airborne surveys uh, to do that. Next slide. Uh, and here's one example of using a drone for uh, groundwater. Um, and thermal imagery imaging to do that. Uh, and there is a, uh, a video as, uh, associated with this that will show uh, kind of the different aspects of, of the, uh, this particular investigation where they used a, a drone to uh, evaluate uh, using structure in motion to structure in motion to uh, determine the uh, detailed topography in the area of this stream, this mountain stream, um, but uh, I'll focus here on the thermal signal. And so you can see from this, uh, from this drone image, uh, thermal image, that uh, we can determine uh, because of the temperature difference between groundwater and surface water and certain times of the year, groundwater may be warmer or colder depending on the time of year but that signal can be seen at the skin temperature of the stream as it's uh, flowing through the system. Now, uh, depending on your objectives, uh, that may or may not be important, but it certainly is important from an ecological uh, standpoint, knowing where the cold water uh, refugia is. It could be important from a contaminant standpoint. When you know that groundwater uh, the groundwater is contaminated and where does it uh, enter into the stream. So these are some tools that uh, that we use to help to characterize the aquifer system. Um, and next slide, Liz. So that framework, sorry, go uh, one more. That's the uh, video uh, that we can't see in this version of it. And so how do we uh, then use that characterize We've characterized the aquifer uh, through hydrogeophysics and other tools. We have the water level information and the water quality information. How do we put all that together? So uh, one of the other uh, key aspects of, of groundwater, the groundwater, um, groundwater studies at the USGS are, uh, is applying models. And so we spend some resources on developing the tools uh, the software for these groundwater model for applying these groundwater models. Uh, one of our key tools is called ModFlow, and the most recent version is ModFlow 6. Uh, this is a version that uh, uh, provides a major update, allowing for uh, unstructured grids in the model, uh, the simultaneous simulation of multiple flow models within the domain of the model, and coupling with other types of models. Uh, the the hydrologic problems that we are presented with today uh, require us to look at surface water systems often or uh, other types of models and Modflow 6 was developed to be able to bring all those together. Um, a few things to point out here, the, the USGS software is all available at no cost. Uh, the, the American taxpayers already paid for that and we make it free. Uh, to anyone to download uh, across the world. You need no license for that. There is a tool called FlowPy. If you're a Python person, uh, it is a, a package that is available to run, to create, run, and post-process uh, all of your ModFlow simulations, all the files associated with it. We also have a graphical user interface tool called ModelMuse, also free, uh, that can be downloaded to apply ModFlow and other USGS modeling tools. 
Um, but uh, um, so ModFlow and uh, other tools allow us to bring to get to simulate the conditions that we've characterized uh, and uh, and the water level information that we've observed. Next slide. So uh, one example of how we're applying ModFlow 6 uh, over a broad area, it can be used in, in uh, it's, we're using ModFlow actually on a national scale uh, for the lower 48 states of the, of the US. We have work going on at that scale. We have work going on at a regional scale that's shown in this, uh, in this diagram as well. Um, as well as local scale in, in investigations and site scale investigations with that same modeling tool. Uh, but this is an example of uh, a model where we have put together a, we had a model from the Mississippi embayment and a model from the coastal lowlands regional aquifer system. And those two uh, within ModFlow 6 can be brought together in the same domain uh, and run at the same time and, and can interact with one another as well. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, we're more and more of the problems that face us and the management decisions that need to be made are about coupled groundwater and surface water flow. Uh, and so uh, some resources at the USGS were expended to put the uh, uh, simulation put codes together, two of our uh, primary codes, one for, for surface water systems, a runoff model, along with groundwater, to put those two together. And, and uh, we call that system uh, GS Flow. And I just wanted to point out that there are other tools as well, depending on your objectives, the objectives of your study, how important uh, surface water is to the study, uh, compared to groundwater or vice versa, or are they both critical? And the tool you use to address that uh, is, uh, in, it's important to select the right tool to address those questions. Next slide. So we use these, these models, these, uh, these codes, um, and the framework information uh, and put it all together into these regional groundwater availability studies. So among the principal aquifers of the US, of the US there are about 65 of those. <clears throat> we selected uh, some of the priority aquifers within that and uh, generated uh, regional groundwater availability studies. Next slide. Next slide is an example of one of those studies in uh, across Montana, South Dakota, and North Dakota, three states in the northern tier of the US is uh, going crossing the border with Canada as well. And this uh, report on the right summarizes, is an example of uh, one of the, of the many studies that have been done across the country. And each of these studies provides the characteristics of the aquifer. Uh, it uh, compiles all the water level information that have been collected it, and it generates a comprehensive hydrologic budget along with the numerical model that allows you to forecast scenarios and assist with future monitoring network design. Next slide. So here's just an example of one of the summaries of how these, uh, how these studies uh, provide water budget information. A simulation, kind of, uh, it's inherent in a simulation to bring all of the relevant information together for a water budget by aquifer. And that's what these, uh, it's one of the, the uh, primary products of these sorts of, of these uh, availability studies. Next slide. So that information helps us to answer, uh, answer management questions, such as in this example from that study, what will happen to the flowing wells in this aquifer if current pumping is maintained. And so the simulation then uh, can uh, run in forward mode to determine uh, what the, at, at current pumping rates or at some future pumping rate uh, across the aquifer, what will happen to those flowing wells. And this, uh, this is just one example 
in the uh, in the report about uh, in the year 2035, uh, which of those wells would stop flowing um, and which might continue to flow. Next slide. So uh, there have been 11 of these regional aquifers uh, completed to date. Uh, and uh, among those 11, we can now compare what the kind of situation is uh, on a national basis, what the situation is in the primary and the principal aquifers across the country. And this diagram and it illustrates that from the perspective of six uh, uh, six characteristics, so uh, what the status is with respect to groundwater level declines, how much storage reduction there has been, whether or not land, land subsidence is occurring, et cetera. And you can read those six uh, undesirable effects, uh, which comes from a, uh, a state-driven document in California called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So that's a way that we uh, then summarize groundwater availability uh, across the nation. Next slide. One slide about kind of future plans, and I've touched on this in my remarks today. Uh, there, we uh, a lot of our work now is focusing on integrated assessments beyond it, just groundwater. The groundwater assessments are critical, uh, but uh, in most cases, uh, groundwater and surface water. Uh, have direct interaction, and it's important to understand that. Not only that, uh, as water resources become more and more precious, uh, we need to be more and more precise about how we uh, how we characterize the, the use, characterize the availability, uh, and forecast uh, situations into the future. And to do that, we need to look at the resource in an integrated way. Next slide. So that's the end of my prepared remarks here. Uh, on the right-hand side, I wanted to highlight, we have a monthly groundwater newsletter uh, that comes out, uh, that uh, is, is available at that URL at the bottom right-hand of the page. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. You can subscribe to that, so it comes to you by email. It's a very uh, kind of quick read. It shows you all of the publications that have come out in that month, any of the soft groundwater software releases that are out, as well as any any uh, one of the requirements we have when we do a model is to provide all of the data files associated with it, uh, and those are available there, or those are highlighted there as well. Okay, so Mark, I'm not sure how you want to transition into uh, into Virginia now, or open up for questions. What you want to do? I think. If Mark, if you don't mind, um, we didn't get any any questions uh, for you specifically, Bill, yet. Um, but I wanted to give people the opportunity to raise their hand um, if they wanted to ask you a question. Maybe that people are just too lazy to type in the box. I don't know. Ah, here I have something from Kevin um, Peterson, and he asks flash um, flash droughts. Uh, are flash droughts a recent phenomenon, and can you predict the onset? Yes. So, uh, good question. Uh, I don't. In my opinion: flash droughts aren't a recent phenomenon, but the description "flash drought" is a recent phenomenon. The language used to, to describe them, uh, I think, um, uh, and so uh, to predict the onset of them. Um, so I think we have a long way to go there. Um, USGS isn't the only federal agency in the US in the US working on this issue. We partner with uh, our National Weather Service on that uh, as well. And I, I would say it's still an area of uh, fertile research is to uh, is to be able to, to predict that. Certainly we are improving our uh, character our uh, monitoring tools for that uh, soil moisture for instance from satellite observations and uh, we are working also on a uh, a system for soil moisture that's similar to the system I described for groundwater for the National Groundwater Monitoring Network where we compile soil moisture information from 
federal agencies and or state partners to, uh, to unify that information. Okay, and then now I have another question from Zahid Gafour, and he says, "Hi, um, the main tool for water budget for water budgeting seems to be physics-based models. However, has the USGS experimented with analytical tools, statistical-based tools such as machine learning, etc., to model aquifers?" <laughs> Great question, Zahid. Um, so I'm a physics-based person. My remarks are biased towards physics-based and, uh, and, and process-based modeling. Uh, most of what we do is process-based, so I think we have a strong bias toward that, uh, but it's not all that we do. And so, yes, there are people that are working on uh, other types of tools, uh, machine learning uh, uh, and other approaches to um, to determining water budgets. We have an effort right now, a five year, we're in the first year of a five year effort to characterize water budgets in the US at what we call the HUC 12, the uh, hydrologic unit code, 12 digit hydrologic unit code. And so that's a, a scale of tens of square uh, kilometers. Um, and, and to do that on a daily basis. So uh, in order to do that, we are exploring many other approach and, there, and we're looking at nine different uh, pieces of uh, the hydrologic cycle to determine that budget on a daily basis at that scale. Uh, so uh, it's a challenge to do that. It's certainly a challenge to uh, do a numerical simulation of the entire United States on a daily basis at that scale. And so we have to be looking at other approaches to determining the budget. Okay, so one last uh, question from Helen uh seller sorry if i got the name wrong um she asks if the regional models that the usgs generates are available for consultants for us consultants local consultants to use for specific questions or smaller scale modeling problems because um apparently in south africa uh she says uh we have a challenge in south a south africa with no regional models so consultants spend taxpayer money uh, remodeling the same area over and over again. Is there a mechanism for uh, to update the regional models? That's a, that's a great question as well, Helen. Uh, the, so yes, in the US, uh, they, those files are available. Uh, <clears throat> so we have had a policy at the USGS since, and that is anything that the USGS does is available. Um, we don't certainly control what other people do. Since 1993, we've had a policy uh, that requires uh, all of our groundwater work in the, in the uh, USGS to be archived, our modeling work to be archived, so that it would be available upon, upon request. In 2015, uh, I established a policy in the USGS that requires that extended that requirement uh, to make it available uh, in a specific format online. So uh, any modeling that we have done, whether it be small scale modeling or these regional studies that I presented, any of that work uh, since 2015 would be uh, available online. Any work done between 1993 and 2015 would be available upon request uh, but you can actually mine that information uh, and we encourage consultants in the u.s to use that information and many do uh, to um, and to take subsets of that regional model uh, for to start their local studies um, and that monthly newsletter that i mentioned uh, provides uh, every month any of the new models that have been uh, completed 
and their the data associated with them it provides links to that so i think it's wise to do that anywhere um, you know it's not without a cost uh, so i can understand why it's not done perhaps in south africa or, or other places but we think it's an important thing to do all right well uh we've gone a little over your time bill but um i think that there are some really good questions um so thank you very much for your presentation and i'm going to hand it over to um virginia mcguire now um mark mm -hmm. do you mind uh, making an introduction so people know who virginia is of course <clears throat> but first thanks bill for your time great presentation and one of the things that is the benefit of this is establishing those contacts and connections. So I'm sure after folks have a chance to process, post-process what you presented, there'll be some additional information requested or contacts. Um, making the transition now to Jenny, as Bill illustrated uh, in some of his talks, uh, we have these principal aquifers of the United States, some of which have been studied intensively. Um, Virginia has been the one who has studied the High Plains Aquifer system intensively for a good portion of her career. She's a hydrologist in the Nebraska Water Science Center. I think it has a different name now exactly, but uh, anyway, in Nebraska. And uh, we chose the uh, High Plains Aquifer because it's probably the best example in the United States that we have of a transboundary aquifer system. It straddles uh, well, at least nine states, and the states are admittedly not countries like in South Africa, but in many ways there is a great deal of similarity. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn the presentation to uh, to Jenny, and I certainly appreciate her time, and, uh, and uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, okay, can you hear me all right? Yes. Hello? Hi there. Oh, good. And, and I'm not sure which screen I'm showing. Are You're you currently seeing the full screen? No, we're seeing uh, the one with the outline, with your outline. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can either, how do I? You can either um, change windows or um, maybe I think in display settings, it might let you. Okay. Oh, actually, okay. yeah. Just, just one click. sec. Yeah, just click the big one. The one that you would want to see. Do you see that now? No, not yet. Okay. All right. Let me just, I'll just kind of, uh, all right. So I'll bring this over here. And, ah. Uh, if you give well, me, um, can you give me, keyboard and mouse control and I can maybe try and fix it. Sure. So it says give keyword keyboard and mouse control to the organizer. Okay. Got it. Sorry everybody for the small technical issue. Got it. Thank you. No problem. All right, so I'll move that over. Okay, so, all right. Um, all right. Okay, so uh, my name's uh, Virginia McGuire. I uh, work as a hydrologist for the USGS, and I'm stationed in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk to you about is our, our study to monitor water levels in the High Plains Aquifer. Um, the outline of the High Plains Aquifer is shown. Can you, let me just ask, can you see my mouse or, um, that's, yes, can you see my mouse? Yes, okay, good deal. <laughs> so the outline of the High Plains Aquifer uh, is shown in this map. So it's in the center of the United States. Um, uh, it underlies eight states, parts of eight states. Um, about 97% of the water withdrawn from the aquifer is used for irrigation of crops. So it's crops like uh, corn, soybeans, cotton, et cetera. Uh, withdrawal and, and irrigation began in the aquifer back um, 
well, it began a long time ago, but say groundwater irrigation in the 30s and 40s, and it it began in uh, in the south and then has worked its way north over time. Uh, the withdrawals have caused substantial water level declines in the aquifer, and um, uh, just to say the uh, aquifer or water resources use is regulated by the states that uh, uh, under the states where the aquifer is located. And the USGS objective in this study is to inform the U.S. Congress, the states, and local entities about the aquifer sta status. And I should say, and I'll say this several times, but we're using data primarily collected by the state and local entities. So water level data collected by the state and local entities. Uh, so in my talk, what I was uh, going to go through are the characteristics of the aquifer. Um, and uh, just to say first is the aquifer characteristics were um, studied in, uh, as part of the, in the early 80s, uh, as part of the uh, USGS Regional Aquifer System Analysis Studies, and so the High Plains was the first aquifer that was studied as part of that program, and so it was characterizing characterizing the aquifer in terms of the geologic units, the underlying geologic units, uh, saturated thickness, um, base of aquifer, all sorts of uh, information about the aquifer and then there was also a model couple of, a model done of uh, what future prospects probably were like given that they had documented the declines across the aquifer so anyway I'll just show you some of those uh, some of that data and including updated maps of the saturated thickness and uh, change in, and the water and storage in the aquifer then next we're going to talk about aquifer status of uh, again, how the aquifer is used, who monitors water levels in the aquifer, and what's the effect of water withdrawals on the aquifer. So show you map changes in water levels. Uh, 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 ugh, I have an error here. So it's like from 1980 to 2015, and then water and storage from 19... Uh, changes in water and storage, again, I, I got this wrong, from 1980 to 2015. And then I have an animation that hopefully will run just showing uh, this data in an animated fashion. Uh, so the, um, again, uh, I'm not going to talk that much about how the aquifer is managed. Our objective is to provide supply information to the states who are responsible for managing the water, uh, the aquifer. Um, uh, and state laws vary. So depending on, yeah, state laws vary. That's from highly regulated to not, not so highly regulated. Uh, so the geologic units that comprise the aquifer, uh, this is just a a map showing them. So it's alluvial systems. Uh, this area here is the sand hills in Nebraska. So these are grass stabilized sand dunes. Uh, and so that kind of, that uh, area acts as a sponge. Water that falls in the sand dunes uh, sinks right down and then acts to recharge the aquifer. You'll see later in the saturated thickness map that the saturated thickness in this area is greater than 1,000 feet, in parts of this area greater than 1,000 feet. Then you've got um, other uh, uh, other deposit, other sands and gravel deposits. Then the Ogallala uh, uh, formation is also an alluvial deposit. And then you've got the uh, Arikari, and, uh, which overlies the the Arikari, which is a siltstone, which overrides the brule. The brule is considered an aquifer where it's fractured, which is just in the upper portion, and then otherwise the Arikari, which again is a siltstone, is an aquifer, but not as um, uh, productive as these alluvial uh, units in the rest of the aquifer. The geologic units that underlie the aquifer, there's various geologic units that underlie the aquifer. And uh, one of the important things about those is uh, some of these units, um, uh, say these Permian units, there's implications if 
uh, of saltwater intrusion can happen uh, of water coming up from these units. Um, uh, so, so it's uh, so it's important that you've got a variety of underlying units, and there can be effects uh, of these underlying units. And these uh, blue lines here are the base of aquifer contours, uh, which are mapped to. Uh, and then, so if you know the, okay, so base of aquifer contours. And then now, what I'm going to show you is the depth to water. So the depth to water goes from uh, near surface. Uh, to greater than 300 feet. Um, and so combining the water table with the base of the aquifer, then you can map what the saturated thickness is. Um, so you'll note in later on in um, uh, when we look at water level declines, if you note some of these areas where there, it's the depth to water is very large, greater, well, greater than 200 feet even. And these are some of the areas where the greatest declines have happened in the aquifer. So large depth to water, going to be less recharge. And um, so again, saturated thickness is from the uh, water table to the base of the aquifer and the amount of water that will drain from the aquifer and this is considered an unsaturated aquifer so specific yield is a measure of what the um, drainable water is from a from a aquifer matrix unit and the uh, specific yield in the aquifer varies um, but generally, it's uh, the area weighted average is 15.1%. Uh, down, this is a map of specific yield. You could ask, how was this done? And what they did is, and this is again was part of the RASA study, they took boreholes, list the logic logs from boreholes across the um, aquifer and rated them depending on what the list description was you know, assigned a specific yield to that interval and then came up with an area weighted value at each point and then mapped that. And so um, the uh, specific yield varies from very um, small, and this is where those arickery units are, the primary aquifer unit, to greater than 30, uh, mainly in alluvial or to 30 in alluvial systems, but again the a the area weighted average is 15.1, and here you've got the uh, area weighted average by state. So the state with the highest area weighted average is Oklahoma, and with the lowest area weighted average is Wyoming. So using that uh, base of aquifer and depth to water, the water table, uh, we can map the sat we map the saturated thickness of the aquifer, and um, saturated thickness ranges from uh, 50 or less feet, which is the gray, uh, to um, a a more than a thousand feet, which is the red. Uh, so. Again, this area here is the sand hills in Nebraska. There's very little cropping uh, or very little um, irrigated agriculture in this area. Be it's mainly rangeland because they can't, um, when they try to plow up that those, the grass that's on the sand dunes, they end up with blowouts and such. So they just use it for rangeland. And which is uh, fortuitous in many ways for the aquifer because that's uh, um, uh, because the, the rain that falls in this area just soaks in. Um, so taking this map of saturated thickness and applying the um, specific yield, the area weighted average specific yield, uh, come up with a estimate of what is the water in storage. Uh, for each one of the states. So um, the bulk of the water in storage is in Nebraska. And the, the next states with the most water are Texas and then Kansas. And then even though these other states, uh, the amount of water with respect to Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas is relatively small, the aquifers still are 
is still very important to those states for uh, irrigation and for agricultural production. Um, so how is the aquifer used? Uh, again, the aquifer is one of the most intensely used aquifers in the nation, and 97% of the withdrawals are used for irrigation. Uh, Kansas, Texas, and uh, Nebraska use about 88% of total withdrawals. So this is a map of irrigated acres, and you could ask, well, how did they do this? And um, what they did is they used um, satellite imagery to uh, identify uh, the irrigated uh, irrigated lands, and then they uh, cross-referenced that with information that they had from the Department of Ag, uh, which is reported by county, these lines here are county lines, uh, of the amount of irrigated uh, lands in that county. So um, I'll show this map again uh, against the uh, areas of water level declines, uh, but um, there and they did this. They did this map for 2012, and they did it for also 2007 and 2005. And I think they're going to do it again. Uh, but it's very helpful to uh, to see the location of of the irrigated acres. Okay, who monitors water levels in the aquifer? Well, again, it's uh, local and state agencies and then federal agencies. So what, what we do is we they send us this data and then we assemble it for uh, to report on water level changes. But um, depending on the state, and this is reflective of how um, um, water is managed, it can be a state entity or it can be a local entity. So for instance, Colorado, the only entity that uh, that we get the data from is the state engineer's office. And then in Kansas, it's um, uh, the uh, Kansas Geological Survey, and, Geological Survey, and then the Department of Ag. And then there's also some management districts. Uh, but in Nebraska, uh, there's 23, they divided the state up by river basin into natural resource districts, and they're responsible for the groundwater in Nebraska. And so they um, they choose when they measure, they and they uh, choose uh, how to regulate groundwater. And, but the state uh, has a uh, an influence on that. But anyway, so in Nebraska, we get data from these 23 entities and from irrigation districts. And in Texas, they've divided that into these underground conservation districts, and they send their data to the state. We pull it from the state, the Texas Water Development Board. Okay, so um, what we uh, so what is the study? Well, one of the, one part of the study is to look at recent changes in groundwater levels. And so what you want is you want water levels that are measured at approximately the same time from one year to the second, to the next year. And and we're doing now, we're, we used to do it annually, but now it's biannual. And um, uh, biannual water level changes. Now mainly the water levels are measured the idea for since this is an aquifer primarily used for irrigation what we want to do is have water levels that are measured after uh, the wells responded or has responded recovered from pumping in the previous irrigation season and prior to the start of the next irrigation season so generally these wells that uh, that I get this data from generally they're measured like say the 2013 water level measurement was January the 2015 water level measurement was January it isn't that they do January one year and May the next year they're very good about uh, being consistent about when they measure um, and they're uh, um, yeah, they're consistent about when they measure. They do QA, QC on the measurements. They'll a lot of times send them to the state. The state uploads them, and then I get them from them. So for the 2013 to 15, there was about uh, 7,500 wells. And uh, this is a map of water level changes in the well. 
um, the um, colors, uh, the warm colors from uh, yellow to red are declines from one foot to 26 foot. The warm or the cool colors uh, from green to blue are rises from one foot to 20 foot. And then the gray areas are areas of no substantial change. Uh, so, uh, so what you can see, I don't know if, uh, well, I'll show this later, but this is an area of, of irrigation or, yeah, irrigation within these states. It's in also areas of very, um, depth of water is very large. Uh, some of these areas, like in Nebraska and Kansas, uh, you'll, the, the rises that you see, it can be a combination, it's a combination of, uh, likely there's a lot of precipitation in this time period. And so it isn't that that precipitation necessarily, you know, is recharging, you know, you have precipitation this summer and you get recharged that year. It's that the farmers maybe don't have to pump at all for irrigation that year. So you have a reduction in pumping because you have sufficient water so that the crops don't need to be irrigated. But the in this time period, the uh, state with the greatest declines, this, and so this is translating this uh, map of water level change to change in storage. And so the uh, state with the greatest uh, cumulative change in storage is Texas. Um, and again, this is a net change. So ne like Nebraska shows up as being a very small decline net, but it depends on where you're at. Um, and in some areas, there's, um, you know, up to a six foot decline, but, but nets out with these areas of rises. So uh, again, this is that same map of water level changes. And then this is just to remind, uh, as a reminder of where irrigation occurs. Um, uh, and generally uh, in the areas, uh, especially, in the uh, western and southern part of the aquifer, if they're irrigating, water level declines happen. So, all right, so we look at short term water level changes and then we look at uh, long term water level changes. And so, uh, the long term map it, we title pre development to 2015. Well, what do we mean by pre development? Pre development is prior to substantial use of groundwater of, uh, in the area, and pre development varies depending on where you're at. Uh, in Texas, development began in uh, the 30s and 40s, it was a lot of flood irrigation, and um, up in uh, parts of Oklahoma, uh, pre, uh, they didn't even develop this area until sometime in the 90s. But anyway, so it's uh, so so what we want for this map of uh, pre-development to 2015, we want a pre-development water level and we want a current water level. The 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 best water level is a 2000, was a 2015 water level, but if we had a 14 and not a 15, we use the 14. Similarly, back to 2011, if we had a 2011, but not nothing after that. Use that for mapping water level changes. And I should say, in one of the states, New Mexico, uh, they measure their water levels on a five-year rotating basis. So. Uh, this is part of the reason for this uh, uh, range of values used because of New Mexico. That if you know, if I didn't use some of these, or the ones that were measured in in the five-year time frame, that I would have very little data to work with. I, I I should say generally across, well, actually for the other states. I use the 2015. I have pre-development 2015. One of the problems that we're running into is that wells that that existed in pre-development and were measured in pre-development, a lot of them are being retired, and so wells are dropping off uh, year by year. And so we may at some point need to go to uh, a different method, but for right now, we do this map using measured water levels. 
So what did we come up with? Well, this is uh, water level changes from pre-development to 2015. And so the changes range from five. So again, the color scheme is the, are the warm colors being declined. So this uh, yellow to red is a five foot to a greater than 150 foot decline. And the uh, rises are from five foot to greater than 50 foot. Um, and then this is taking this map and using it with specific yield to calculate the change in water and storage. So what's the state with the greatest uh, amount of declines? It's Texas. And what's the state with the least amount of declines? It's South Dakota. Um, uh, so, yeah. And so then this is a total for the aquifer. And again, this is showing, uh, again, oof, this is, uh, Lordy, this is uh, the 2012 map. Um, I should say it's not like, you know, once a, a farm ir is uh, converted to being irrigated, they put in the infrastructure to irrigate it, they generally do continue to irrigate. And so it isn't that these irrigated acres change a lot. Uh, the one thing that does happen in, uh, again, in like northeast Nebraska and parts of Kansas here, is that if there's su sufficient uh, precipitation, they may not irrigate. Um, uh, now, you may wonder what is going on in this part of Nebraska where you see these rises. And what's going on there is there's canals, surface water canals that uh, leak. And that is um, the reason for the rises in those in that area. So this is a graph of this table here, but just to show it in a different way. That again, the greatest declines uh, have been in Texas, followed by Kansas and Colorado, and then. Um, uh, the declines in these states are in South Dakota. It's it's not as South Dakota is able to um, uh, uh, regulate usage, and uh, so it's it's not as much of a problem in South Dakota. But in these other states, even though the change in storage looks relatively small relative to these states, it does have a big effect and is of concern to the um, to the water resource managers. And I should say, for instance, in Nebraska, um, declines, even small decline, there's, um, uh, you know, interaction of groundwater, surface water, so groundwater, or groundwater discharges to streams, so even uh, small declines in um, uh, in water levels can affect that interaction between the aquifer and stream. So now what I want to do is show you uh, some maps of water level changes from 1980 uh, through 2015. Um, and I, uh, I'll say that these maps were done uh, for another federal agency uh, they wanted to try to assess the um, the efficacy, if you want to say that, of uh, the conservation reserve program. So they, the, the the USDA pays farmers to um, convert irrigated lands that are highly erodible into uh, CRP. So they plant, they change back to grasslands and they'll uh, pay for that conversion. And so what they wanted to try to do was assess um, the how effective those conservation reserve program um, uh, acreages were. It ended up we weren't able to show much of anything, but what I was what I did is uh, I, I made these maps in the hope that they could assist them in that effort. Uh, and it's it's instructive for showing uh, water level changes in the aquifer over time. So it's different periods, like this is a 15 year period, and then there's five year periods. Um, so um, the, uh, 
the, again, the colors are the warm colors. This is three to more than 40 foot of decline, rises three to more than 40 foot. The state with the greatest amount of uh, changes is uh, Texas with a decline of um, 18 feet. And the state with the greatest rises is Nebraska. And I should say, this area here in Nebraska was identified as part of the RASA study. Uh, there were substantial declines there because they had drained a bunch of wetlands. And so the, the local NRD there, the Natural Resource District, uh, had um, programs to try to restore that area. So that was 90, 80 to 95. This is 95 to 2000. And again, the warm colors, one to 45 foot decline. The cool colors, one to 15 foot rise. And um, the rises is a indication of a wetter period, uh, which can mean a little bit reach. It can re be correlate a little bit as far as recharge, but uh, probably more to reduce pumping. And so the state with the greatest decline was Texas and the rise was, um, or the rises was Nebraska. And this is 2000 to 2005. And um, um, so the greatest declines were in Nebraska and um, the least declines were in South Dakota. And the um, uh, declines were from one to more than 45 foot and the rises from one to more than 15 foot. And this is 2005 to 2009. And um, uh, again, the, the warm colors, one to 45 foot and the cool colors, one to 15 foot. And the state with the greatest declines is Texas and rises, net rises are in Nebraska, but as you can see, there's big areas in Nebraska with declines also, as well as some of these other states. Okay, so that was, oops. 2000, okay, so we're 2005 to 2009, 2011, huh. 2009 to 2011. So um, uh, state with the greatest declines, Texas and Nebraska has the greatest rises. And 2011 to 2013, I don't know what year, what was it was in South Africa, but in the high plains and uh, the high plains in 2012, 2011, 2012, it was a drought across the whole area. And this map is reflective of that. The greatest declines were in Texas um, uh, with little change in South Dakota and Wyoming, but it, uh, it was uh, substantial declines across the state, across the aquifer. And 2013 to 2015 um, uh, is again, it's a wetter period or that drought, the drought was over by then. And uh, the uh, declines, the greatest declines are in Texas, um, Texas, and then again, South Dakota and Wyoming had very little change. So this is a graph putting putting all those uh, uh, changes together, and aquifer wide, what you can uh, what this graph story is that the, it's. It's every year, it's a decline. Overall, it's a decline. But the story by state can vary. Um, uh, yeah, so it can be, but if you have a year with a substanti substantial um, droughts, uh, it, it greatly, it's greatly affects um, all the states. Okay, now what I'm going to do is show you this animation. This was, the way this was done was to take the data and, um, yeah, take the data and animate it. That's pretty simple. Um, so, 
there's no no um, audio with it but um, again it's saying the USGS compares water levels measured every year to get changes from one year to the next and then just use those changes to map it across the aquifer. And uh, so this is showing uh, water level changes in the aquifer. Down here is the slider, one, 1950, and this, the latest data used in this was 2011. And again, the warm colors are decline and the um, cool colors are rises. And then, then the rest of the, the rest of what I have in here are just uh, I just picked out some references that if you might be interested in, and they're all online, so the URL is um, provided, and including uh, references about groundwater flow models for the aquifer and water quality studies of the aquifer, and then just general. Um, general reports about, for instance, stream flow depletion and the importance of um, long-term water level data. Um, that, so that's the end of what I have. Thank you, Virginia. That was really great. Gives us a much better understanding of how a big system is monitored and so forth or over time. I'm going to turn control to Liz about questions and stuff and I'm going to have to sign off myself but thanks again Virginia and uh, I'm sure people will follow up with some questions. Yes so thanks. I have uh, okay. one question another question from Helen um, and she says thank you this is all very interesting I'm familiar with the papers uh, from an investigation we completed on groundwater sustainable sustainability concepts um, very nice to put a voice to the work that we've referenced. So she's got three questions. <laughs> um, the first one is, what is the expected projected simulated groundwater level decline for the aquifer based on the permitted groundwater abstraction? All right, so I don't have, um, I don't have that in my, uh, the report that would address that, but it would only be for the Northern High Plains, um, would be a report by uh, Steve Peterson. And he's uh, recently uh, completed a, a groundwater flow model for the Northern High Plains. But I guess I should say what uh, he's still working on is the future model, future predictions model. And that report isn't done yet, but it will be done within the next few months. Um, so uh, I don't know, when people ask me that, like, well, actually the way they'll say it is, when is the aquifer gonna be depleted? Um, and uh, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, and I think the best answer is from a groundwater flow model. And, but I don't know if when Steve did all of his uh, if he was able to capture, uh, you know, really granule detail about what the permitted amounts are. But I know he did do uh, simulated, um, or he did uh, simulate what uh, the water levels would be like. And I'm thinking he went out 50 years. So I, I, I uh, and so the Northern High Plains, it's at this pinch point in the center of Kansas there. 
and up to the north. That's what he modeled. Now, if you go down from south of that, uh, in Texas uh, and Kansas, their state models, um, they're the ones working on what um, on future predictions. Um, uh, and I don't have an answer for that. I guess bottom line, I don't have an answer. But I I know that what Kansas is trying to do, say Kansas, what they've tried to do since the 90s is they have most of their irrigation wells metered. So they have a pretty good handle on what pumping, pumping, is, pumping is happening, but they uh, have substantial declines. And what their approach is, what Kansas approach and Oklahoma's approach from a regulatory standpoint, seem is more to manage the decline. It's not that you're getting to sustainability, you're managing the decline. And I'd say the same thing in Texas. They're managing the decline and trying to plan for, well, if we don't have we don't have the high plains aquifer, you know, what else can we do as far as changing different crop types, trying to use deeper aquifers, but then some cases when you go to deeper aquifers, you've got water quality problems. So, um, yeah, so, and then in Colorado, a lot of what they've done is they've, uh, they pretty closely manage pumpage there. Uh, so in some cases, farmers have had to go to dry land in Colorado. Uh, and I, I'll say one of the drivers in, uh, in these states, say Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, is you've got the river systems that are fed by groundwater and then there's, there's lawsuits related to flow in the rivers. So, uh, a strong impetus to curtail pumping or to manage pumping, say in Colorado, is um, because of these compacts that have been um, negotiated between the states of Colorado has to deliver this much water to Nebraska, Wyoming has to deliver this much water to Nebraska, Nebraska has to deliver X amount of water to Kansas. So there's multiple drivers that um, that are in play that the states are working with, but I'd say, in a, you know, as far as groundwater pumpage in these areas that have, have had persistent substantial declines, it's more managing the decline versus uh, sustainability. And now okay. I don't know if I forgot one of your other questions. No, no, no. I, I was, I'm, sta I'm uh, stating the question, so. Okay. Uh, okay, so the second question is, are there any negative impacts of this water level decline? What is the equivalent change in discharge of the aquifer? Um, are there any negative impacts of water level declines? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, um, okay, so let's start talk in, pardon? Sorry, do you see subsidence there? No. That you don't see subsidence. That's one thing about it. And I think if you go back and look at um, Will, Bill Cunningham's map, he on the high plains. That's one of the things he highlights too. There's not subsidence because it's not a matrix. It's not a clay kind of matrix. It's a, a alluvial sand and gravel matrix. It doesn't subside. So subsidence isn't a problem. But say in um, uh, Texas, what uh, what farmers have had to do, and this is more, uh, you know, I've heard them talk about it, I haven't actually gone down to see this, is say back in the 70s, a farmer would have, a, uh, or maybe not the 70s, before the 80s, they had a center pivot that was running off of one well. And so maybe you're irrigating a, a, a square mile or something with one well. But now pumping maybe 800 gallons a minute. Over time, what's come to is they maybe have uh, eight wells in that same section pumping at 100 gallons a minute, feeding that one pivot, and maybe that pivot can't even irrigate the whole field. So in Texas, where what you can see is decreased water availability for irrigation, and um, in I'd say particularly in Texas, that's what you can see. In 
uh, in Nebraska, Colorado, um, and this has to do with, say, in this Republican base, this is what Republican rivers to so the Republican basin. Nebraska has to deliver X amount of water to the Republican River. Well, there's a lot of groundwater recharge to the Republican River. So there's big lawsuits associated with that. So what um, a negative impact of pumping is decreased flow to the river and therefore um, the uh, the natural resource districts in this area have had to maybe, uh, well, in some cases what they've done is they said you only can irrigate an average of, and now I can't remember, it used to be 13 inches, I think maybe now it's like nine inches in every five years, that's all you can irrigate. So it's a reduction in the amount you can irrigate. Um, uh, and um, in color, or it's maybe you go to dry land, like I was saying before. So yes, there are impacts of these declines. Oh, and the other thing, uh, say there's um, oh, Pumpkin Creeks up in this area, which used to be a perennial stream that flowed. And even though in Nebraska, there's not much declines in this area, uh, the perennial reach of Pumpkin Creek has greatly diminished. And also the perennial reach of many of the streams in this area has greatly diminished. It's because of an impact of water level declines are that the uh, it's reduced that interaction or changed that interaction between the aquifer and surface water. Okay, so what our last question for today is um, is uh, so there is clearly economic benefit to the to groundwater use. What groundwater water level decline is considered acceptable in a cost benefit assessment? balancing economic and environmental impacts? Well, the way this is, um, pro or the way um, this is assessed is it's, it's assessed at a local level. And um, in this part of the United States to grow most of these crops, especially when you get west of say around this, there's inadequate precipitation to grow corn, soybeans. So, um, so there's interact, inact, inadequate precipitation typically, and so people have to ir irrigate. Now, if they can't irrigate, um, there is going to be an economic impact of that. And the way this, I guess, I go back to, it's really the states decide how they're going to manage this. And the way they've stated the management is to manage the decline. In states with, uh, yeah, they manage the decline because there's the recharge to this aquifer is very, very small in the areas of big declines. The recharge very, very small. So um, uh, as far as I don't know that there's necessarily been a study and say, well, we can, um, you know, we can handle maybe, so it's up to 150 foot declines in some of these areas where we could handle from the pre-development side, we can handle up to um, uh, 200 foot. Well, you're just gonna exhaust the aquifer. And the other trade-off there is people use this for domestic supply. So um, I don't know that it's, it's, it's assessed that way. Maybe if you were back in the 1980s or maybe back in, uh, back in the 1980s, maybe you could have, and I think people did try to do that, but it's, it's that, um, irrigation and this is an ag area it's integral to the business and um, as long as they're able to, you know and a whole host of factors come into whether or not it's economical you know what's the power cost to run the irrigation what's the land cost what's the crop what kind of price you're going to get from your crop so um, Guess the bottom line, I don't think it's been stated as systematically as that. It's just people have, um, um, just, well, generally they've just, 
they've decided this is an ag area. They want it to stay an ag area if they can. They need to irrigate in order for that to happen. And um, they try to manage the decline so that it's uh, it doesn't to try to extend the life of the aquifer. Okay, well, thanks, Virginia. I don't know if that answers your yeah, question. No. I mean, <laughs> cost benefit analysis is its own huge topic. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, that's all for today. And I want to thank uh, our panelists today, um, Virginia and Bill. Um, I think Mark had to. Mark, are you still here? Did you want to say bye to people? I think he had to, to leave. Anyway, um, bye, everyone. And thank you for tuning in. And um, a, I'll send out a, a link to a video of this presentation um hopefully next week thank you bye everyone yes bye bye